Det er forstændt. Good evening. I want to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order. It's 7 o'clock on September the 16th, 2019. I certainly want to welcome everyone here tonight. We're so glad that you're here with us. And also for those people who are watching our meeting on television, we're glad to have you with us. I'm now going to ask if you would please join me in a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. Councilmember Reese, would you please lead us in the pledge to the flag? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, colleagues and everyone here. Uh, if it's your practice to do so, and if you're able, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> pledge I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Council Member. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council Member Alston. Council Member Caballero. Here. Council Member Freeman. Council Member Middleton. And Council Member Reese. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Middleton uh, is away at a, I believe, a National League of Cities event. Uh, but two of our members, uh, unusually, are ill tonight, I'm sorry to say. Uh, nothing serious, but not both of them not feeling well, so you just have the four of us. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, that we have a motion. We already have given Council Member Middleton an excused absence, but I'll now accept a motion to give Council Member uh, Alston and Council Member Freeman an excused absence. I'm moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we give excused absences to Council Members Alston and Freeman. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. And we hope that our colleagues will be feeling better soon. And now uh, we will have the ceremonial items, and uh, I'm, I'll be doing the first one, and then I'll, my, I'll be joined at the podium by my colleagues for several of the other ceremonial items tonight. And Council Member Reese, would you join me for this first item? I will, Mr. Mayor. Council Member Reese is our, our City Council liaison, along with Mark Anthony Middleton, to the Sister Cities Committee of Durham, and uh, we are very, very excited tonight. Uh, I'm going to be inviting up uh, Mayor Astrid Fodor from the mayor of Sibiu, Romania, and all of her delegation, and those of you all who are here from Sister Cities and, would, and, and, and from our local Romanian community, if you would all like to come up and join us here with the mayor, that would be wonderful. I have already asked for the sash. The <laughs> yes, we have already discussed that the that the mayor of Sibiu has a beautiful sash, and I would like such a sash. And they are, <laughs> the sash is in the Durham colors, as you can see from our flag, which is over there. I second that, please. <laughs> 
Is that local exactly, yes. exactly. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Madam Mayor, yes. come on right here, and I'm going to, uh, I'm first going to read this uh, proclamation, and then I'm going to ask if you would say a few words. Whereas, Durham is a city that promotes mutual understanding and cooperation among all its citizens. And whereas Durham is a city that believes in the dignity and worth of each individual, regardless of the national origin of our citizens, which makes Durham a very diverse community. And whereas Durham desires to promote and maintain a wholesome climate of goodwill among peoples of all nations. And whereas the Durham community knows that inclusion, respect, and understanding of all those that work, play, worship, and live here promotes a community that we can be proud of. And whereas Sister Cities of Durham Incorporated, as sister cities in the countries of China, Costa Rica, England, Greece, Japan, Mexico, Romania, Russia, and Tanzania, and whereas the Board of Directors of Sister Cities of Durham and the City Council have approved the application of the City of Sibiu of Romania to be a sister city with the City of Durham, North Carolina, and whereas the two cities have decided to enhance mutual understanding and friendly cooperation between American and Romanian people. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, on this day of September 16th, 2019, declare Durham, North Carolina to be the sister city of Sibiu, Romania, and hereby urge all citizens to honor the principles of equality and mutual benefit in the fields of education, economy, trade, science and technology, culture, environment, sustainable energy, sports, health, and personnel to promote common prosperity and the development in both cities. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this the 16th day of September, 2019. And Madam Mayor, I will present this to you and ask you if you would say a few words. Yes, thank you. Madam Mayor, speak into this because we have yes. people listening and talking. Yes, okay. Dear Mayor Shuel, I repeat. Esteemed member of the local council, Dear friends in the board of the city, city sisters community, uh, committee, dear members of the Romanian community, and dear guests, Sibiu and Durham have shaken hands to become partners, eager to exchange best practices in benefit, to the benefit for their communities. I have had the pleasure to get to know Durham in the past days, and I'm truly impressed. Durham is interesting and beautiful. Until we will have the pleasure to welcome you in Sibiu, please allow me to introduce you our city, locked in Transylvania in the middle of Romania. By the way, I'm sure that most of you heard about Transylvania from movies, from literature. <laughs> it's a homeland from Dracula, the vampire. But I can assure you it's only a legend in Sibiu and in Transylvania that didn't exist vampires. <laughs> Sibiu is defined by over 800 years of history. The old name of the city was first mentioned in a document issued in the year 1191. Mm -hmm. Over time, Sibir was a fortress with three fortification belts and guard towers. Many sections of these fortifications are still standing today. Historical buildings host museums, stores, and public institutes. The central squares are cozy for open-air coffees, but also a perfect stage for hundreds of events taking place here. The old streets in the historical center host charming restaurants and a lot of attractive shops. Valuable heritage means high touristic potential. Sibiu understood that, and after consistent investments in rehabilitation, the historical center is a magnet for hundreds of thousands of tourists every year. For all this, Michelin, the prestigious Green Touristic Guide, awarded Sibiu its highest quotations, three stars. Sibiu is the only city from Romania to receive this honor. Our valuable built and spiritual heritage goes hand in hand with culture. In Sibiu, we have a national theater which organizes every year in June the greatest European International Theater Festival. And also we have a ballet theater, a theater for children and youth, a state philharmonic, 
and two large museum complexes, always European acknowledgement. Sibiu has always been a cultural city, but in the past 15 years, culture become a motor of development. Hundreds of cultural events taking place in Sibiu, giving life to the city. They attract tourists, and tourists bring income to the city. For this reason, the city administration spends around 14% of the local income supporting cultural operators and events. Sibiu is known as a city of culture and cultures. The unique character of the city results from its history, but also from the multicultural environment. Today, the great part, the majority of the city population are Romanian, but Germans and Hungarians also live here. In the past, the German ethnicity was significantly larger, and this is a way because our city is well known as a Saxon city. The old name of the city was Hermannstadt, the city of Hermann. Sibiu is an intersection of cultures, ethnicities, and religious cults, which found a good way to coexist peacefully and open the city to Europe and to the world. Sibiu was the European capital of culture in 2007, and this year, we held the title of European Region of Gastronomy. City life is completed by the oldest and most beautiful zoo in our country, the most impressive traditional household open-air museum and other important objectives in the surrounding of Sibiu. Several mountains resort and salt lake resorts, great numbers of sex and fortified churches around Sibiu, and many villages preserving Romanian traditions. Even if Sibiu built its character in the past, today the city concentrates on the future. The city invests in increasing the quality of life by upgrading the infrastructure, the green, the sports, and the leisure areas. We invest in education by upgrading and expanding kindergarten and schools, in health by upgrading and modernizing hospitals, in public transport by renewing fully the local transportation fleet, in smart public lighting, in digitalization. Sibiu is also a successful business location, well connected to Western Europe by roads and by the international airport in Sibiu. The excellent economic development of Sibiu ensures substantial income to the local budget, allowing us to keep investing and keeping unemployment close to zero. The automotive industry is very well represented in Sibiu by European companies producing her parts for Porsche, BMW, Mercedes, Renault, General Motors, and others. Other industries, such pharmaceuticals, Garments, production, food industry, construction, IT domain, and services are also well represented in Sibiu. Last but not least, Sibiu gained step-by-step -step an international acknowledgement. This year, on May 9th, our city hosted the European Summit, where 27 presidents and heads of the government adopted the declaration of Sibiu. Due to the position, and the capacity of Sibiu to handle international projects, this year we received the news that Sibiu will host the only three-star NATO command center in Eastern Europe. It is a great honor for Sibiu, but also a huge vote of confidence. This was Sibiu by short. I hope <coughs> you will visit our city to know the city better and the people. I uh, will conclude by thanking Major Sushuel and the local council for accepting Sibiu as a partner city. Uh, and as the highest representative of Durham, I invite you to make a visit to our city, your new partner city, sister city. At the same time, I want to uh, thank Mr. Brady Soros and the Sister City Committee for receiving us so warmly. Last but not least, I want to thank Mr. Mitch Skurto 
Mr. Dorothy Kitchen and the wonderful Romanian community which initiated this project and make it possible. So many thanks to all. Thank you for taking care of us these days. And thank you all the guests who are here in this room. And thank you for listening. I want to again thank the mayor. Uh, she and her delegation have been here several days. I do want to say to our city attorney, if there's a city council member here from CBU who handles the legal affairs for the city of CBU, she is an instructor, she is a professor of German. Wow. So you have some competition, Madam Attorney. <laughs> I am not that skilled. <laughs> So many hats to wear. Uh, but I want to also add my thanks to Mr. Mitch Skirtu and Ms. Dorothy Kitchen, uh, who formed the first bonds, uh, and to Brady Searles and all of those on the Sister Cities Committee, to our Romanian community who has rallied around this idea of a sister city from Sibiu, and uh, to the mayor and all the delegation that made the trip over here. And I look forward to visiting Sibiu very soon. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Success. Mayor Frodo. I think this is your proclamation. Yes. It's yours, yes. yes. Thank, you. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll see you in the city. Yes. Hey, Anne. <laughs> All right, thank you for, that was a great, uh, great moment. We have some other ceremonial items tonight. And first is a proclamation honoring the Durham Senior Hunger Awareness Week. And um, I'm going to ask uh, Patricia James, who is founder and president, to pre please come forward. And anyone else that you would like to bring with you who is here to celebrate this, if you could please come forward and also, um, I'm going to ask Councilmember Charlie Reese if he would do the honors with his proclamation. Gail, are you the? Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. It looks like Gail Adland and others are here uh, to uh, uh, to accept this proclamation. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to read the proclamation. Um, on Senior Hunger, Hunger Awareness Week, and then we'll have some folks come up and talk a little bit about why that's important. Whereas approximately 10 million older adults nationwide, or one in six, face the threat of food insecurity, North Carolina's senior hunger rate ranks second worst in the nation at an estimated one in every five seniors. And whereas Durham County Social Services estimates that of the 60,000 Durham County residents age 60 or older, 12,600 are at risk of food insecurity due to living at or below 199% of the federal poverty level. And whereas up to 50% of older adults nationwide may be malnourished, an estimated one third of older adults admitted to hospitals may be malnourished and thus subject to longer hospital stays and more health complications than those with adequate nutrition. 
And whereas food insecurity is associated with poor chronic disease management and decreased health-related quality of life, with food insecure seniors being 50% more likely to have diabetes, three times more likely to suffer for, from depression, 60% more likely to have congestive heart failure or heart attack, and twice as likely to report gum disease and asthma. And whereas food insecure seniors have increased likelihood of entering healthcare facilities, convalescent homes, assisted living, or may be forced to move in with relatives and receive inadequate care, which eventually leads to higher healthcare costs as chronic conditions worsen when remaining untreated. And whereas Durham's Partnership for Seniors through the Committee on Senior Food and Nutrition is working in conjunction with End Hunger Durham to create awareness of and solutions to senior hunger in Durham through building partnerships among governmental departments, nonprofits, medical and educational institutions, religious institutions, and community volunteers. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 22nd through the 28th, 2019, as Durham Senior Hunger Awareness Week in Durham, and hereby acknowledge that senior hunger in Durham is a problem that needs to be addressed through community-wide awareness and action. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, the 16th day of September, 2019. Good evening. I'm Gail Adland. I'm the Director of Meals on Wheels of Durham. I'm here with Betsy Kreitz from End Hugger Durham and a group of other people who are uh, part of this um, Senior Hunger Awareness Week. So as, as Charlie read, the, um, this is a, a huge issue nationally. The average life expectancy in the United States is at a record high of over 79 years. As we get older, even the most independent among us may experience physical difficulties or financial hardships that strip away our independence. We add that to an increase in geographic mobility among our families, and the result is that millions of seniors nationally are left behind, hungry and alone. As was in the proclamation, North Carolina is one of the worst states in the nation for senior hunger. There's only one state where there are more seniors are more at risk for hunger than North Carolina. And in Durham alone, over 12,600 seniors are at risk of hunger based on income alone. So our elderly neighbors, maybe some people that you know, and maybe some people in this room, are making decisions on a daily basis about whether to purchase medicine or food, whether to keep the lights on or to eat. A good question to ask is, what can you each individually do about this? As with most social issues, there are three main options to think of. One is to advocate. If you look at the End Hunger Durham website, you can find ideas on advocacy. Make sure you ask your representatives whenever you get the chance what they're doing to alleviate senior hunger. We're going to have a table at the farmer's market on Saturday the 21st and on Saturday the 28th, so come see us there and we'll give you more things to think about. You can volunteer. You can help nonprofits whose focus is senior hunger. You can help pack food. You can help sort produce. You can help deliver meals. And thirdly, you can donate. Find an organization whose work resonates with you and support them financially. You can hold a food drive. You can go gleaning. You can just do anything to work on this issue. And just remember, as with most issues, no individual person and no individual organization can solve this issue alone which is why all of our organizations are working together, because together we're very much stronger than we are alone. So thank you for helping us bring attention to this issue. I'm taking a picture. Sorry. Joe, you want to take a picture? Come on. Come with me. Come on, Joe. Yeah, that's probably not going to work. <laughs> okay. Hold the proclamation. There you go. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. All right. Our next proclamation is also regarding hunger, Hunger Free Durham Month. And I'm going to ask Council Member Reese if he would also do the honors on this proclamation. And to receive it, I'm going to call up Jim Keaton, Director of Durham Public Schools Nutrition Services, and Scott Harris, Program Coordinator for Durham Public Schools Nutrition Services, and anyone else that you might like to bring up with you 
Uh, before, as they come up, I do want to say one thing about uh, their work this summer. Uh, the city uh, was fortunate enough through the National League of Cities to receive a grant uh, from, for a program called CHAMPS, which was to increase the number of children that we were able to feed in the summer, uh, both uh, breakfast meals and lunch meals. And we, we, I didn't do anything except cheer them on, but I'll say we as a community knocked it out of the park. Uh, we're going to meet a little bit later tonight, one of our champions for this. Uh, but um, we served, I believe, 22,000 more breakfasts and 20,000 more lunches than we had the summer before. And it was because of these good people uh, and the work that they did. And I'm just very, very, very uh, want to say that uh, before Charlie reads, because we're very impressed. I think I remember how this works. <clears throat> going to read the proclamation, and then we're going to have the folks who actually do this work come tell you a little bit about uh, what they're working on. <clears throat> Whereas one in seven North Carolina residents face food insecurity, with many families not knowing where their next meal will come from. Whereas children are at a higher risk of hunger, and a hungry child cannot grow or learn. 19.6% of Durham County children face food insecurity, and federal nutrition programs play a pivotal role in reducing childhood hunger and fostering children's development. And whereas the summer food service program, the school breakfast and national school lunch programs, the child and adult care food program at risk after school supper and snack program, the supplemental nutrition assistance program or SNAP, and Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, all provide important nutrition for children and families throughout our city. And whereas, by increasing participation in the aforementioned federal nutrition programs through community outreach, partnership, and collaboration, the city of Durham can increase access to healthy meals. And whereas, Durham is committed to making sure no child, adult, or senior goes hungry year-round through the creation of Feeding Durham's CHAMPS, and whereas Durham has a strong network of meal providers, faith-based and community organizations, schools, volunteers working with Feeding Durham's champs in the fight against hunger in our community. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 2019 as Hunger-Free Durham Month in Durham, and hereby acknowledge the reality of food insecurity and the need for involvement in the movement to end childhood hunger in Durham. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, the 16th day of September, 2019. So, thank you. I don't want to take a lot of your time, but I do want to thank the mayor and the city council and Tom Bonfield, the city manager as well. The National League of Cities grant <clears throat> provided $128,500 to the city of Durham in order to help fight childhood hunger. And we used that grant money to look at four different focuses. One was increase in breakfast participation in our schools because we were only serving about 20 to 25% of our kids and we need to feed more of them. You can't go to school if you're hungry. So we have free breakfast in every school in Durham Public Schools now so every child can eat for free, no applications, no statuses, no stigmas. A second part of that was increasing the summer meals participation. And we were able to bring in from last year we had 96 sites, this year we had 117, we increased sites. We increased participation, and we were able to feed more hungry children. The third part was offering meals during spring break. We started that last April. We had success at the North Durham Regional Library and Oxford Manor, and we want to grow that program this coming spring break. And the other exciting part was getting the chance to serve meals for dinner, and they're called at-risk dinner meals, which does not sound good. Nobody wants to be at risk. So we call it the super snack attack meal. And we've started serving those meals at Burton Elementary, Spring Valley Elementary. This week we started at Fayetteville Street Elementary, Shepherd Middle School. And we're going to be rolling out into more schools in the next few months. So we're really excited that this grant has given us that opportunity to make these changes and to feed the hungry children of Durham. And we thank the mayor, the city council, and Tom Bonfield for that opportunity. Thank you. Another photograph, another photo opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to give, uh, as these folks are 
leaving the podium, I also want to give a shout out to Peter Skillern from Reinvestment Partners. Peter was the one that really uh, was helped us, help the city get this grant together. Uh, and Peter's not here tonight, but he also had a big role to play in this. Uh, we're now going to move to our next uh, ceremonial item, which is a history moment. And I'm going to ask our, our public historian, Eddie Davis, if he would come forward uh, to talk about Sam Reed and the five freedoms of the U.S. Constitution. Eddie, it's all yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening to the council and to the staff. Um, as you all are aware, National Constitution Week is annually commemorated during, the, during September 17th through 23rd. Our United States Constitution is the linchpin for de the democracy that we enjoy in our great country. The preamble, the articles, the original Bill of Rights, the subsequent amendments to the Constitution articulate the governmental, the societal, and the individual rights that protect freedoms that we enjoy. Looking back over the past 150 years of Durham history, there are many <laughs> women and men who have exemplified the importance of freedom and the bridging of the gaps that exist in our communities. Although there are many wealthy and powerful folks who have helped to build and support our community, most of the positive and lasting change has been symbolized by regular, ordinary, common men and women. Musically, when I think of the nobility of the regular, ordinary, hardworking people, I think of Aaron Copeland's fanfare for the common man. And I think of the Durham-based a cappella group, Common Woman Chorus. In fact, the distinctive and steady and insistive a percussive beating of the timpani and the blaring trumpet sound of Aaron Copa's fanfare seems to symbolize one of Durham's most lovable characters of the 1970s, the 1980s, and 1990s. Sam Reed was not a large man, but in terms of his robust advocacy, he was a giant figure in the lifeblood of this community. He was able to stretch his small frame across racial, gender, age, labor, social barriers during the final quarter of the 20th century in the Bull City. Sam Reed's preparation for his Durham tenure stretched from the Ukraine and the Soviet Union to the freedoms that we enjoy in the United States of America. Sam Reed embodied the five freedoms of the First Amendment of the US United States Constitution. The freedom of religion allowed this Jewish immigrant to escape the grasp of the Russian Revolution. His work as a union organizer during the Depression and his brief membership in the Communist Party were protected by the freedom of association and the right to peacefully assemble. He was blacklisted during the era of United States Senator Joseph McCarthy. Sam Reed used the freedom of the press and the freedom of speech to publish the Trumpet of Conscience, which was widely distributed in Durham and beyond. Distributed in Durham and beyond. Sam Reed used the freedom to petition the government in order to advocate for the official naming of, the, of Durham's Martin Luther King Parkway. He particularly wanted to ensure that our MLK Parkway flowed through neighborhoods and business areas that were racially integrated. Sam Reed's work was recognized by the Durham City Council, the Durham Board of County Commissioners, the former independent weekly newspaper, the Haiti Heritage Center, and the Durham branch of the NAACP. As mentioned earlier, Sam Reed stood tall for justice, equality, and the American way. Sam Reed was a wonderful poster child for the United States Constitution. In this 20th year after his death, and during this sesquicentennial year, Durham still salutes the many bridges that were built by this great common man named Sam Reed. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. That was great. Uh, Sam was a friend of mine as well. He was not a large man. He was quite a bit shorter than I am, if you can believe it. Um, and Eddie, uh, I'll tell you one other fact about Sam Reed. He, when he had to, he took a, a new name, uh, actually as a, partially as a result of having been blacklisted during the McCarthy era. 
and he chose the name Reed after John Reed, the uh, journalist who covered the Russian Revolution and is buried in the Kremlin Wall, which I always thought was <laughs> very Sam Reedish. Uh, but uh, uh, thank you so much for that presentation, Eddie, and for remembering a, a wonderful man uh, from Durham. Uh, we'll now have another proclamation, and I'm going to ask Councilmember Javier Caballero if she would join me. And uh, we are, I'm going to ask the folks, uh, I'm going to ask Michelle Old, founder and executive direct, director of the Diaper Bank of North Carolina, to please come up, and anyone else that you might like to bring with you, Michelle, we're, we're glad to see you. And I'm going to ask uh, Councilmember Caballero if she would do the honors. Good evening. I'm delighted to read this. Uh, Michelle is a neighbor of uh, mine and our kids are close friends. So, Whereas diaper need, the condition of not having a sufficient supply of clean diapers to ensure that infants and toddlers are clean, healthy, and dry can adversely affect the health and welfare of infants, toddlers, and their families. And whereas national surveys report that one in three mothers experiencing diaper need at some time while their children are less than three years of age, and 48% of families delay changing a diaper to extend their supply, and whereas the average infant or toddler required an average of at least five, 50 diaper changes per week over three years, and whereas there are no government assistance programs for the purchase or provision of diapers, and a monthly supply of diapers can cost as much as 6% of a full-time minimum wage worker's salary, therefore obtaining a sufficient supply of diapers can cause economic hardship to families, and whereas a supply of diapers is generally an eligibility requirement for infant and toddlers to participate in child care programs and quality early education programs. And whereas the people of Durham recognize that addressing diaper need can lead to economic opportunity for the state's low income families and can lead to improved health for families and their communities. And whereas Durham is proud to be home to various community organizations, such as the Diaper Bank of North Carolina, that recognize the importance of diapers in helping provide economic stability for families and distribute diapers to poor families through various channels. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 22nd through 2018, 2019, as Diaper Need Awareness Week in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to donate generously to diaper banks diaper drives, and those organizations that distribute diapers to families in need to help alleviate diaper need in Durham and environs. Witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 16th day of September 2019. Good evening. I started the diaper bank in 2013, right here in Durham for my kitchen table with the goal of providing 50,000 diapers in the community. We are now the largest diaper bank in the country. We um, distributed 4.3 million diapers last year. We have three warehouses across the state, but Durham is our largest. We distribute 300,000 diapers a month, and we work with over six to 800 volunteers a month that make that possible. The reason why we have a diaper bank is one in three families experience diaper need. There's no assistance for diapers. WIC and food stamps do not cover them, and they cost up to $100 a month. So families are making really tough decisions between buying food or buying diapers, and every single time, families will choose to feed their children and try to make those diapers last as long as they can. So we see babies left in one diaper a day, Families rinsing out and reusing diapers, and parents making really tough decisions about basic needs that they shouldn't have to make. I encourage you to come visit our warehouse. You can wrap diapers and cover babies' bottoms. And thank you so much to the city of Durham for recognizing Diaper Need Awareness Week. Thank you so much. We'll now move to another proclamation for National Preparedness Month, and I'm going to ask Mayor Pro Tem Jillian Johnson if she will come forward to do the honors, and I'll ask Jim Groves, Director of Durham County Emergency Management Division, to come forward and anyone else that he might like to uh, bring with him. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, for the opportunity to read this resolution here in the First month of hurricane season uh, here on the East Coast. 
Whereas National Preparedness Month, occurring annually in September since 9-11, creates an ideal opportunity for every resident of Durham, North Carolina, to join citizens across the United States in preparing their homes, businesses, and communities for any type of emergency, including natural, technological, and human-caused. And whereas the Federal Emergency Management Association announced the 2019 National Preparedness Month theme of Prepared Not Scared. And whereas planning now before a disaster is the best way to improve community resiliency from disaster. And whereas the City County Emergency Management Division partners with federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, private, and volunteer agencies to educate individuals on local hazards and how to prepare for them. And whereas the City County Emergency Management Division informs residents on how to take action through its Alert Durham public education campaign. And whereas all residents of Durham, North Carolina are urged to plan ahead for disasters and encourage their family and friends to do so by visiting the Preparedness Campaign website at alertdurham.com. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim September 2019 as National Preparedness Month in Durham and with the theme, Prepared, Not Scared. I encourage the community to observe this month by preparing for emergencies before they occur in Durham, North Carolina. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this the 16th day of September, 2019. Right, good evening, Mr. Mayor, council members and managers. My name is Leslie O'Connor, and I proudly serve as the Division Chief of Emergency Management for the City and County of Durham. We're honored that the City of Durham is recognizing National Preparedness Month along with federal, state, and other local government partners. This year's theme is Prepared Not Scared. Over the past two years, Durham's been directly affected by two named hurricanes, flooding, two events of over a foot or more of snow, and most recently that are on all of our minds is a gas explosion that occurred in April. It's our mission in emergency management to ensure public awareness of the potential hazards residents face and to ensure the continuity of government operations when they're affected. We invite our employees and also our residents to consider this. If an official knocked on your door and advised you to leave your home due to danger, could you gather the necessities that you need in 10 minutes or less? If the answer is yes, then we applaud your efforts and ask you to be our champions for preparedness. If not, we ask you to check out our website at alertdurham.com for tips and trip, tricks on preparing yourselves and your loved ones uh, for being ready for any type of event that could come our way. This simple step will ensure that you as well are prepared and not scared. Thank you. Right, our final ceremonial item tonight, last but not least, I would like to invite, uh, invite Marcella Thompson, a resident of PAC-1, if she would please join me for the neighbor spotlight. Ms. Thompson and anyone else that you would like to bring along with you. Alex, how are you? Good to see you. And I'm gonna hand this to you, Ms. Thompson. And I'm going to read a little something about you. Marcella Thompson is the recipient of the Neighbor Spotlight for the month of September 2019. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve the community. This month, Marcella Thompson, a resident of Calvert Place in East Durham, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood, including, but not limited to, preparing meals to serve children in her community using her own money, before being referred to and accepting funds from the Summer Meals Program, which this guy is here to represent, creating a space where children not only come for breakfast and lunch, but also to enjoy games and activities, organizing monthly birthday parties for the children in her community, for her selflessness, passion, and commitment to the children and families of Durham, 
Congratulations, Ms. Thompson, on being the September Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham. And thank you for all of the work you do to improve our Durham community. And I want to turn the microphone over to you, Ms. Thompson, for a few words. And I want to congratulate you on behalf of our city. This is kind of great for me. I'm just a little old lady that lives in my community with children who need more than just food. I was very grateful that Sky and Mr. Jim gave me the grant, helped me with the food for uh, the mustard seed project because I have often said, you know, Lord, if you tell me what you want me to do, I will always do it, always. And I was wrestling over how am I going to feed my children this summer because I don't have as much money as I used to have last summer. And lo and behold, my friend, the mayor, sent me to Miss Guy. And when I met her in her office, I took her some turkey vegetable soup and some crackers because she had no lunch. And so she told me, we will give you breakfast and lunch for your children. And she asked me what I wanted to name my project, my site. And I said, can I name it the Mustard Seed Project? And she said, you can name anything you want to. <laughs> and so with the faith of a mustard seed, the scriptures say, you can speak to the mountain and it will move. With the faith of my teeny little social security check, I spoke to the mountain and I said, God, I want you to move for my children. It's wonderful to have full bellies, and it's wonderful to have food and lunch and know that while I'm giving you snack today, you're asking me, what are we going to have tomorrow? Children don't do that unless they're hungry. We live in a food insecure space in East Durham. And you just don't need food for their bellies. That was wonderful. But you have to have food for their souls. And I'm asking all of you, we all can do something. We can look around in our own neighborhoods. But take a chance and ask the Lord, what is your little mustard seed? And what mountain do you have to move for your ch neighborhood children? I thank you for this. I mean. I just do what I do, and this is just really wonderful. And I couldn't do anything without this young lady right here. This is my daughter, Alexandria. And whether she feels like it or not, she helps her mommy, who's crazy, working 12 and 14 and 16 hours, seven days a week. And she says, Mommy, you got to stop, but I know you're not, so I'm going to help you. <laughs> so I thank you for this. And I thank the mayor, and I thank Miss Skye and Mr. Jim for believing in this little old lady in East Durham and supporting me in everything that I've done. And I challenge you guys, I challenge everyone. The Mustard Seed Project is looking for a place to be. We've outgrown my little tiny apartment. And so anybody with a building, anybody with some land, we need a place to be because we're going to do food and we're going to do tutoring, and we're going to do all kinds of wonderful things for these children because they're my little unicorns. And I tell them all the time, you're magical. And you can be and do anything you want to do. You just have to think that you can do it. Thank you so much for this. Congratulations, Marcel. All right, we had a lot of great ceremonial items tonight. 
more than we usually have, but they were beautiful. And, uh, and now we'll move on with the rest of our agenda. Uh, first of all, are there any announcements by members of the council? I do. Do you have an announcement, council member? Council member Caballero. Sorry. And, and then me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I just wanted to note that Hispanic Heritage Month kicked off on September 15th, and I want to uh, acknowledge all the wonderful events that are happening in our community. This coming Saturday will actually be the unveiling of some beautiful murals on Chapel Hill Street uh, at 1.30 in the afternoon. And I also want to say, uh, Feliz Fiestas Patrias a Mexico, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, y Chile. Gracias. Gracias, Councilmember. Councilmember Reese. Mr. Mayor, I had an announcement, but first I just wanted to say that last um, ceremonial item actually got me a little choked up. Um, this is, <laughs> this is an amazing city and the people of this city have such a huge heart for each other and I'm just so grateful to everyone who was up there and, and all the work you're doing. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Uh, but what I wanted to say, Mr. Mayor, uh, is that every year in Durham is an election year. Uh, in any even numbered years, we get to talk about things like presidential races and senators and governors and state legislators and sheriffs and DAs, but in odd numbered years, Mr. Mayor, Municipal elections take center stage, and we get a chance to talk about our issues and the direction we want to take the city, and that begins this year in two days. Early voting for the municipal primary starts um, this Wednesday, September 18th. Uh, early voting is for two weeks this year, leading up to the nonpartisan primary on Tuesday, October 8th. So between this Wednesday and Friday, October 4th, um, early voting will happen every single day, um, and there are four locations for early voting. Uh, the Criminal Justice Resource Center in downtown Durham, South Regional Library, North Regional Library, and uh, NC Central Turner Law Building on the campus of NCCU. And on Mondays through Fridays, early voting will be open 8.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturdays, 8.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. and on Sundays, noon to 4. I don't know why they all have to have different hours, but there it is. <laughs> um, so encourage everyone uh, to go online, learn about the candidates, find candidates that support your vision of the city that we want this to be, and then make, make a plan to vote early. Um, if you try to make a plan to work on the day of, of the, of, to vote on the day of the primary, lots of things can happen. Your kid can get sick, you can get a flat tire, um, and so you don't want that to happen. So plan to vote early um, when lines are shortest and you'll have a lot of opportunity to do it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Member. Council Member Reese. Uh, I have an announcement. Uh, the council, as we do every year, uh, deliberates around this time of year uh, and evaluates, uh, does a performance review of our city employees, three city employees that the council employs. Uh, we did not, um, we did not uh, do a performance review of our city attorney this year since we just hired her very recently, but we did do our usual performance review of our city manager and our city clerk. City Manager Bonfield is not here this evening, uh, and he's ably represented uh, by Deputy City Manager Wanda Page, uh, and our City Clerk, uh, Diana Schreiber, is here this evening. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we, our evaluation of both of those employees uh, showed us, showed what we all know, uh, that they have both done an excellent job in the past year, and the Council has been very appreciative of their work. Uh, we will take a, although we do deliberate on these personnel matters uh, in closed session, uh, we're required to vote on their salaries in open session. And so uh, the salaries that the council uh, discussed for these employees uh, with their raises uh, in closed session uh, were uh, for the clerk $97,335 and for the city manager $255,191. And I will now accept a motion uh, that we approve those salaries. Move approval. Second. Okay. And moved and seconded that we approve those salaries. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes four to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to uh, priority items by the city manager, M Madam Manager. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem, members of the Durham City Council. I have no priority items this evening. Thank you very much. I'll now ask the city attorney any priority items, Madam Attorney. 
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. The City Attorney's Office also has no priority items this evening. Thank you. Madam Clerk. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Um, the City Clerk's Office has no items. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now move on to the consent agenda. This consent agenda can be approved by a single vote of the council. Uh, any member of the public or any member of the council can pull an item from the consent agenda, at which time, at, in, in which case it will be taken up at the end of the council meeting. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a point of order, please. Please. Um, it's my understanding that it's possible to pull an item from the consent agenda for a separate vote, but not require that the item be discussed at the end of the agenda. Is that correct? Um, except that we would hold the item until the end of the meeting. But pulling an item for a separate vote, we're certain necessitates putting it at the end of the agenda. I don't, it doesn't necessitate it, but that's been our practice. But is there something that you had in mind particularly? Yes, I wanted right. to um, pull item 19 for a separate vote so that I can make a brief comment before we vote on it. But I don't require any additional input from Understood. staff or the, or the, the vendor. Uh, yeah, that's fine. We can do that. Right. That's that's at my discretion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> uh, I like having discretion like that. Um, it's better than not. All righty. I uh, will now move on the, with the consent agenda. Item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, human relations commission appointment. Item four, recreation advisory commission reappointment. Item five, recreation advisory commission appointment. Item six, Durham City County Environmental Affairs Board appointment. Item seven, discussion on the community safety task force. Item eight, affordable housing bond advisory committee report. Item nine, FY 1718 emergency solution, solutions grant with Urban Ministries of Durham subrecipient contract amendment for rapid rehousing services. Item 11, electric bus procurement. Item 12, U4724 Cornwallis Road sidewalk and bike lane municipal agreement. Item 13, First Amendment to contract for uniformed unarmed security guard services in the parking garages. Item 14, cell tower lease and license agreement with T-Mobile, 1701 Coal Mill Road. Item 15, cultural and public art resolution to incorporate membership changes and department affiliation. Item 16, private drainage assistance projects, SD 2018-06, member number two. Item 17, private drainage assistance projects, SD 2018-08, amendment number one. Item 18, stormwater infrastructure repairs, SD 2019-01. Item 19, municipal separate storm sewer system, MS4 inspections, SD 2019-06, and SD 2019-07. And that's the item you'd like to pull, Council Member? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Item 20, stormwater infrastructure repairs. SD 2019-02, amendment number two, and it looks like we have a resident who would like to pull this item. Is that correct, Mr. Andrews? Would you like to pull this from the agenda? It's Mr. Andrews, this item is on the consent agenda, and if you, it, it, we, the council has already uh, uh, reviewed it and is planning to pass it tonight. If you have something that you would like to say of particular interest, we can pull this item and hold it to the end of the meeting. Is that what you like to do? Okay, thank you very much. Item 21, amendment number six to the scrap tire disposal recycling service contract between the city of Durham and Central Carolina Holdings, LLC. Those are the items on the consent agenda and it, with the exception of items 19 and 20, I will ask for a motion that we approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and second that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I think the motion member, passes four zero. I'm sorry, Madam Clerk. Thank you. I was in too much of a hurry. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think that we'll move now to item 19, municipal separate storm sewer system. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to uh, comment briefly on this matter because this item um, generated uh, some discussion at our work session about the demographics of the of one of the two contractors identified in this particular item. Um, and uh, I reached out to staff during the course of the intervening week to ask a series of questions about this item. Um, and what I found out is, the one, first question I asked was, were there no subcontracting opportunities identified for this project? Generally speaking, when we have uh, a contract for services for the city, say a construction project, uh, we will hire a large contractor who then will satisfy certain um, requirements for minority and women-owned business participation by having subcontractors take that role from our list of 
uh, certified um, uh, minority women-owned businesses that qualify for this type of work. Um, and that was not done in this case, and I wondered why. There's two reasons. Uh, number one, um, the work itself did not lend itself to subcontracting because it is simply the inspection uh, that is dis the inspection of the sewer system that's described in the in the agenda item. There's no like the, the, this particular contractor will not hire a separate vendor to do any part of that work. They'll just send the folks out to do the work. The other um, the other complicating factor is that there are no certified women or minority owned businesses identified by uh, our in our database that perform this specific type of work. Um, and so. Um, while it would not normally be my preference to recommend or to approve a contract with a uh, with a um, with a vendor who had these types of demographics, I think in this case uh, the alternative is not doing the work itself. And staff has made it clear to me that these are important projects. This is an important project that needs to move forward. And so, with that understanding, and with no other, if no one else has anything they'd like to say, I'll move the item. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Moved and second that we pass item 19 to authorize the city manager to execute this contract and to also uh, two separate contracts. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 4 0. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I also just want to thank our staff for uh, pro working quickly to provide me that information. So thank you very much. Thank you, Council Member. I think I'm going to go ahead and do item 20 now. Uh, Mr. Andrews. Uh, would you like to speak on this item now? Why don't you please come to this podium right here? Welcome, Mr. Andrews, and you have three minutes. Thank you very much. Um, the, the item that I'd like to speak on is the uh, stormwater repair uh, along Alleyway 13. And I, I want to speak in support of that repair Certainly, there's currently sinkholes that are uh, blocking uh, school children from getting to, to school. Excuse me. But, but, but I think what's not being addressed is the water load coming off of Duke's campus, which is currently spilling over Buchanan uh, into my yard and kind of overwhelming that system. So I think that it is admirable that you're, you're spending the money to, to fix, to band-aid the broken pipe, but that's a lot of money that's being spent that will most likely break again. And I, I can't seem to find uh, a group of the city to talk to as to how to solve that problem. And so I, I guess what I'm doing here in my three minutes is not arguing for or against, but really appealing to understand the process and how to make the situation better, because I'm spending a lot of money uh, repairing my property from water damage multiple times a year. You're spending a lot of money to repair pipes that I believe are going to continue to break. And there doesn't seem to be a long-term solution to 35 acres of impervious runoff from a major university that's going into one 24-inch pipe. I think in a good description would be we're, we're shooting a fire hose at a drinking straw, and the drinking straw is failing, and it's making a mess of everything. I don't think the solution is to put another drinking straw in its place. And I understand that infrastructure is a huge expenditure, and it's a long-term thing, and I'm not asking for a solution overnight, but what I am asking for is the ability to, to be a part of a larger discussion. And I haven't found an avenue for that yet. Um, but I do know that 35 acres between Main Street and Markham is too much to feed into a 24-inch pipe that's been there for 100 years, a pipe that runs very close to my foundation and is currently, um, it is currently pushing water onto my property and creating sinkholes, along with the sinkholes that are forming underneath your public streets and sidewalks. Thank you. Can we have a response from staff, please? <coughs> good evening. Dana Horncole with the Public Works Department, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening, Dana. Um, Mr. Andrews raises a, a difficult question, and uh, I believe that the, the best answer to provide is that 
Um, City of Durham and the older parts of town was developed at a period of time when the stormwater regulations were much different than they are now. The city and the department are looking at regional uh, improvement <coughs> plans for different areas of the city where we're experiencing flooding and repeated infrastructure failures, particularly in our stormwater uh, system. And we're working in conjunction with our water management department in their rehabilitation projects. I would say that water management department is a little further ahead than public works is with our stormwater division, primarily because they existed longer than we have. We're a much younger group. Um, but regional stormwater development is something that we're taking into account and looking at regional areas where flooding is occurring. Thank you, Mr. Horncole. And uh, I assume Mr. Andrews could be in touch with you if he wanted to have further discussions of his particular, uh, his particular area of town. Great. Mr. Andrews, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. I didn't hear a next step, but I do appreciate your time. Pardon me? I appreciate your time. Okay. I'll follow up. Yeah, follow up with Mr. Horncole. Okay, we'll now uh, accept a motion on item 20. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we authorize the manager to, to amend the existing contract uh, and to amend the existing contingency fund and to authorize the manager to negotiate additional change orders. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. All right, uh, we'll now move on to the general business public hearings, item 23, consolidated item New Haven townhouses. Good evening, I'm Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. I would first like to state for the record that all planning department hearing items have been um, advertised and noticed in accordance with state and local law and affidavits of all notices are on file in the planning department. Requests for a future land use map amendment and zoning map change have been received from Jared Edens of Edens Land for one parcel of land located at 2600 Ellis Road, totaling 9.116 acres. The applicant has applied for a zoning map change from residential suburban 20 to plan development residential 6.239 with an associated development plan that stipulates up to 55 townhouse units. The area is designated industrial and open space on the future land use map, and the applicant is seeking low medium density residential, which would coincide with the zoning request. Key commitments include limiting the number of units, stipulating the housing type, setting a, max, a maximum impervious surface of 70%, dedicating additional asphalt along Ellis Road and additional asphalt for the construction of future bicycle, a future bicycle lane. The Durham Planning Commission at their June 11th, uh, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 12 to 1. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map. The second is to adopt a consistency statement. And the third is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunyak. Uh, you've heard a report from staff. I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions for Ms. Sunyak by members of the council. Hearing none, uh, I'm going to now turn to our public comment. One person has signed up to comment on this item, Mr. Edens, Mr. Jared Edens. Uh, Mr. Edens, welcome. Uh, you have three minutes. Uh, if you decide at that point, if, if we decide after that you need more, uh, we can work that out. This is a public hearing. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, good evening, members of the council. Jared Edens with Edens Land. I appreciate your time this evening. I also appreciate Jamie's time throughout the, the last few months working on this project. I just want to add a couple of things to the staff report. Um, to me, I think this is a good location for additional density. Uh, the location is very convenient. It's Ellis Road. It's 10 minutes to downtown, it's 10 minutes to RTP. My office is right behind this, this property, actually. Uh, there's adequate infrastructure, roadway capacity, water and sewer actually crosses across the property. Um, I do think that allowing townhomes in lieu of the single family would lead to a lower price point than what you could get currently. Um, if you were to zoom out on this area, there's a lot of activity in this area. Uh, you have apartments east of us, you have 
apartments and towns and singles, all three across the street from us. I think by adding another section of townhomes here, it just provides that third housing option that we look for. Uh, we had a neighborhood meeting in February of this year. I have no opposition that I'm aware of. I would like to add two proffers, if I could. Um, actually, I'm sorry, one proffer. Uh, we'd like to proffer a payment of $8,250 to the uh, Durham's Affordable Housing Fund. This payment would be made uh, prior to the first final plat for the project. Uh, that number came from uh, our zoning of 55 units uh, at a rate of $150 a unit, which is a rate that, that I've used on multiple zoning projects. Um, I would also normally offer a school's payment as well, but this project actually reduces the number of students from existing, so I wish I had the one proffer this evening, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edens. Uh, are there any questions for the applicant or for staff at this time? Let me ask, is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? Is there anyone here tonight, this is a public hearing, who would like to be heard on this item? Right, any questions, any comments by members of the council at this point? If not, I'm gonna declare the public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. We would need a motion to adopt a resolution amending the future land use plan. The second motion would be to adopt the consistency statement. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we adopt the amendment to the future land use map. Second. It's been moved and seconded. We adopt the resolution amending the future land use map. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 4-0. Uh, we need a motion to adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second. We adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 4-0. And finally, a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. We'll now move to item 24, zoning map change by Magnolia Creek phase four. Uh, and we'll uh, begin with the report from staff. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. A request for a zoning map change has been received from Jared Edens of Edens Land for one parcel of land located at 4700 Danube Lane 1018 Old Evergreen Drive, totaling 6.71 acres. This site was included in the Belvin's Property Development Plan, which was P02-55, which was approved by City Council in 2003. The area corresponding to the current application uh, called for 13 single family lots. The applicant is currently seeking a zoning map change from planned development residential 4.990 <coughs> to planned development residential 7.899 uh, with a development plan that stipulates up to 53 townhouse units for this area. The area is designated low density, uh, low medium density on the future land use map, which coincides with the zoning request. <clears throat> the original PDR zoning is compliant with all of the provisions of that approved development plan, including project boundary buffers, impervious area, tree coverage, and open space. The Durham Planning Commission at their June 11th, 2019 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of eight to three. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt a consistency statement and the second is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak. You've heard the report from staff and I'm gonna now declare this public hearing open. And first I'm gonna ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Tem. Ms. Sonyak, we have a question. Um, so I was hoping that staff could address the comments that were brought up um, by Planning Commissioner Miller regarding the legal concern about separating out a portion of a previously zoned residential tract um, and that affecting the PDR of the remaining property. So yes, there was some concern regarding whether or not the um, the entire development plan, because this 
proposal is just for a certain area of that. Mm -hmm. um, there was some concern uh, regarding whether or not the um, entire development plan uh, deviated from certain provisions and whether or not there was a significant change. And as a result of that, there were questions relative to whether or not uh, areas outside of this subject area should be noticed um, and uh, whether the case should be brought back concerning all of that. Mm -hmm. um, that issue was reviewed by the planning director and also by the city attorney's office. Um, and as noted in the staff report, it was determined that it was not a significant change. Um, and as a result of that, um, the uh, it, it did not require going back in front of the planning commission. I don't know if the planning director has anything else to add regarding that. I want to ask the, uh, oh, it looks like the planning director might have something to add. I think uh, Pat Young with the planning department, I think Ms. Sonyak did an excellent job of summarizing that. We, we took the concern very seriously. We disclosed this issue in our planning commission staff report. We looked at it very closely. We carefully recalculated the density of the remainder portion, the original 2003 rezoning, and it fell within the parameters of the original zoning and did not exceed the calculated density and therefore was not um, subject to the concerns that Commissioner Miller raised. And we looked at that carefully with uh, Attorney O'Toole on Ms. Rayburg's staff. Ms. Rayburg, would you like to comment? I really don't have anything to add, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I do remember uh, Mr. Young and Mr. O'Toole discussing this at some length and um, I concur with the staff's commentary on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mayor Mayor uh, I have a question as well. <clears throat> and this regards Planning Commissioner Baker's comments. Uh, as you all know, uh, Mr. Baker, on many of the uh, rezoning applications that we've received recently, has been commenting about the need for um, a variety of changes uh, that he believes are necessary uh, to be some that he thinks need to be done, uh, as he called them, short-term fixes, require sidewalks on both sides of the street and all new developments, increase the city's existing street connectivity ratio from uh, restricted maximum block length to new developments, add green building standards and incentives, potentially using a developer-friendly point-based system, add a bare minimum of building sta design standards and at least address building orientation, parking location, first floor facade transparency, um, new zoning districts that require a mix of housing types, require a moderate mix of uses, require that all new homes be within a quarter mile and so forth. Um, I wonder if you could comment on Mr. Baker's comments, not to each specific point, but in a general way, uh, and and discuss whether or not these will be the kinds of uh, the kinds of issues that uh, we will be addressing in the comprehensive plan uh, rewrite. Uh, any any perspective that you could give us on that, Mr. Young? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Mayor, to speak to that because um, Commissioner Baker is a very articulate advocate for a position that I think we share in principle, which is that the quality and character of new development should be equal to um, the quality and character of existing development, that it should have the same type of uh, um, um, access, um, quality of infrastructure, parks, and other amenities. Um, very helpfully, and we've had a lot of ongoing dialogue with him, he's um, put some details in the proposals, and you excerpted those in your comments. Um, some of those we are addressing through what we call our omnibus changes, which you see every six to 12 months including um, the next round that will be coming in the next several months, requiring sidewalks on both sides of the street. Um, so that one side of the street was kind of a legacy position from uh, earlier this century. And there are a few other changes we're, we're um, going to be proposing. Um, a number of the other changes that Mr. Baker is recommending um, will have, I think, substantial um, indirect and unintended consequences on things like um, housing and land prices because they can be very costly, like converting existing um, state roads that were designed for farm to market to city, city street standards. Those would have costs not just for the development community, but for the city. So they're gonna have to be looked at very closely and thoughtfully. Um, 
cost it out and weighed against other priorities, and that will be something we do with the comprehensive plan process. So he's really helped us with that process, and we absolutely are going to address each of those concerns. Many of them will be through the comp plan, and, and some will come before you in the next um, several months. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate those comments. Thank Thanks. you so much. All right. Uh, any other questions for uh, staff at this point? If not, I'm going to uh, ask, we're, I'll, I'll ask uh, for our public comment. Uh, we have one person signed to speak up, signed up to speak on this item. Again, Mr. Edens, welcome. Uh, Mr. Edens, you have three minutes. Good evening. Uh, Jared Edens with Edens Land. Uh, again, thanks to staff and thanks to uh, Mr. Young for explaining some of the background on the zoning. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of history that's not in the staff report. Um, as mentioned, this property was rezoned in 2003 as part of a larger project. A couple years ago, we, we actually went through the detailed design process uh, two or three years ago uh, for the 13 single family home uh, version of the property. Got it ready for permitting and you know, bid it to contractors and whatnot. It was evident that, that the home price is necessary to cover the construction cost for this particular piece of property, which has very bad topography needs a lot of field dirt. The only way you can cover that cost is to increase the density. If, if it was to stay single family, it will, would most definitely remain undeveloped um, for good. I feel very certain of that. Uh, so what we're doing is proposing to change it to townhomes to get a higher density, greatly reduce the price point. Um, I think this is similar to the last project we talked about as far as this is a third housing option. Right at that node at Danube and Hebron, you've got apartments, singles, and now this is more townhomes. I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we are proposing a pedestrian connection uh, to the remainder of Magnolia. We'll have a um, little stream crossing pedestrian bridge. Similar with the last project, I think uh, capacity here is great for infrastructure. The adjacent roadway capacity is well in the capacity. Uh, water and sewer is not an issue here. Uh, we did meet with the neighbors back in April. Um, I do have two proffers to add. Uh, we'd like to propose a payment of $1,000 to Durham Public Schools uh, due prior to the first final plat for the project. That's based on two additional students and $500 a student. I'd also like to proffer a payment of $7,950 to Durham's Affordable Housing Fund. Also due prior to the first final plat. It's based on 53 units at the rate of $150 a unit. And I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edens. Is there anyone else who would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing item. <coughs> yes. Can you give us your name and address, please? Sure. My name is Giselle Feiger. I'm a resident at Magnolia Creek at 1014 Old Evergreen Drive. So my property, the back of my lot would abut this proposed zoning change. Hence, I received a letter. Um, altogether, my family and neighbors and I are okay with there being townhouses on the other side of our lots. The only thing that we would really like to know, and this may be a question for other the gentleman over here or the planning uh, commission, is that when we purchased our homes, we paid a premium for these particular lots to back up to trees and to have a tree line and quiet uh, on that side of the lot. And so we were, we were told there would never be building on that side. So we were a little surprised to receive this notice. Um, with that being said, my question really is, will we continue to have the trees, the protected trees that we were told were protected, um, to line the back lots that we paid a premium for? Ms. Feiger, thank you for being here. Thank Can you. I ask Mr. you to Mitchell. please go over to the clerk's office and just fill out one of the cards so we have a record of you being here. Okay, That'd absolutely. Be great. You can do that now or you can do it before you leave. Thank you. Sure. And I'm, I'm first going to ask uh, Mr. Edens if he would address that, and then we'll ask staff to address it. So you can take a seat. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate the question, and the answer is yes. Um, her, all the properties along Old Evergreen back up to a buffered stream has a 100-foot buffer on both sides. Uh, so actually the townhomes would be very well insulated from the existing single family. Can I ask staff if they could comment on that as well? Sure, Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. If uh, on the development plan attachment number five, the third sheet, um, you'll see the area that we're talking about. Um, Evergreen, old Evergreen Drive with their single family uh, development. Behind that, there's an area that, um, that is open that won't be developed. 
Further behind that is the riparian area, which is um, what Mr. Edens had referred to with a 100-foot buffer and a 10-foot no build on either side, and the building envelope is beyond that. Okay. So it does sound like you will have a substantial buffer, and it looks like Councilmember Reese is going to help you see more about that. Is there anyone else that would like to comment on this item? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard? Thank you. Okay. Ms. Figer, do um, you have any more questions or concerns? No other questions. Okay, thank you. It does sound like there will be a significant green buffer yeah. that remains. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to comment? This is a public hearing item. If not, uh, are there any other questions or comments by members of the council? I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we would need first a motion to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 4-0. Thank you. The second motion will be to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move to consolidated annexation item, uh, I'm sorry, item 25, consolidated annexation, All Saints United Methodist Church. Good evening, Jamie Sanyak with the Planning Department. Request for utility um, extension, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning map change have been received from Tim Sivers for two parcels of land located at 116 and 120 Smallwood Drive, totaling 11.27 acres. The properties are owned by All Saints United Methodist Church. The purpose um, of the annexation is to extend the water to the existing church. The area is presently zoned rural residential and staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning district. The annexation petition is for a continu contiguous expansion of the corporate city limits. Should the, should the council act favorably, approval of this annexation petition and zoning would become effective on September 30th, 2019. City and county operational departments such as Solid Waste, Fire and Emergency Service have reviewed this request and have not identified any significant negative service delivery cost or impact. Public works and water management departments performed, performed the utility impact analysis for the utility extension agreement and determined that the exist, existing city of Durham, water and sanitary sewer mains have capacity to serve the project. The budget and management service department performed a fiscal impact analysis, which determined that this proposed annexation will become Revenue negative immediately upon annexation since this application is for a nonprofit. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this request. Um, the first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is for the consistency statement. And the third is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. We've now heard the report of staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any comments or questions for staff by members of the council. Hearing none, I'm going to now turn to our public comment. We have one person who signed up to comment, Mr. Tim Sivers. Mr. Sivers, welcome. You have three minutes. And if this is a public hearing, if you it turns out you need more, we'll arrange for that. Thank you. Uh, Tim Sivers, Horvath Associates, 16 Consultant Place. Uh, thanks to uh, Jamie and all the planning staff for all the work they have done on this project, uh, not only co correlating with myself, but also members of the church. So I definitely appreciate their uh, their, appreci their time and their uh, with this project. Uh, as Jamie did mention, this is an annexation of approximately 11 acres. Um, <clears throat> the adjacent uh, development is extending a water line along the front of their site. So they want to uh, work towards moving off the well and septic and connecting to the water. Uh, sewer is available. That'll be a connection will be made in the future if needed. Um, and that's, that's it, sir. So if you have any questions or if there's any questions of the members of uh, the council or staff, myself, and a representative of the church is here for tonight. Thank you. 
Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Sivers. Are there any questions for the applicant or for staff at this point? Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm wondering if the church has any additional development plans for their property. We can see on our map that the church is pretty small, takes up just a corner of the area. There's a lot of vacant land that's being annexed. So just wondering if there's any plans to develop any of that in the future, or if this is, um, if you just want the water and sewer to serve the existing church. Uh, there's no, no plans for expansion this time. It's just to be able to connect to the water and sewer for, uh, for the ability if the, for the well and septic to be removed off that system. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Are there any more comments or questions? If not, I'm going to, well, first of all, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? It's a public hearing item. If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Um, we would need first a motion to adopt an ordinance annexing All Saints United Methodist Church into the city of Durham. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance annexing the church. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 4-0. Thank you. The second will be the motion to adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. Moved and second that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 4-0. Thank you. And then motion number three to adopt an ordinance amending the D Durham United Development Ordinance. So moved. Second. Been moved and second that we adopt the ord uh, to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And again, the motion passes 4-0. Thank you so much. All right, we'll now move to item 26, Consolidated Annexation 5510 Barbie Chapel Road. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Request for a utility extension Voluntary annexation and initial zoning map change have been received from Angela Bailey with the International Monastery School for a 38.51 acre parcel located at 5510 Barbie Chapel Road. The annexation is for a contiguous expansion of the existing city limits. The area is presently zoned Rural Residential and Falls Jordan Lake Watershed Protection Overlay District B, and staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning district. The proposed annexation area is designated very low density residential on the comprehensive plan, future land use map, which is consistent with this zoning request. If the zoning is approved as recommended, the proposal, the proposed educational facility and soccer club, which currently has a site plan under review, which is case D1800241, would be permitted with a minor special use permit. Should the council act favorably, approval of the annexation petition and zoning would become effective on September 30th, 2019. City and county operational departments, such as solid waste, fire and emergency service have reviewed this request and have not identified any significant negative service delivery costs or impacts. The Public Works and Water Management Departments have report, prepared utility impact analysis for the uh, utility extension agreement and determined that the existing City of Durham water and sewer service mains have capacity to support the projects. The Budget Management Service Department performed a fiscal impact analysis, which determined that the proposed annexation would become revenue negative since the school is a non-for-profit. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is for the consistency statement. And the third is to adopt the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak. You're having a busy evening. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we have now heard the report from staff, and I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions for staff by members of the council. I do have one question. This may be a question that's better put to the applicant, but a soccer club is being put here, Ms. Sonia? That um, 
Yes, that is the case. It's a um, educational facility with soccer club. Okay. Maybe I'll ask the applicant a little bit more about that when, when the time comes. Are there any other questions for staff at this point? Question, Mr. Mayor. It's <laughs> currently on the site. Just one minute, please. Sure. Thank you. Let me pull up the application. We are going digital, so I'm using my cell phone to try to. OK. We endorse the new technology. <laughs> I hope you're connecting through the Wi-Fi so it's not to tax your data plan. <laughs> Or city business. <laughs> so the, uh, there's a, a Pat Young again with the planning department. There's photos on attachment 12. Um, my understanding is that it was formerly a ch church facility. I don't know if it was the same applicant or another applicant, but it's no longer being operated as a church. Okay. So they, they have a use permit application in, um, which will be required to do, to do any of the uses that they're seeking. And again, beyond that, you probably would want to ask the applicant about their intent on the site. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for us? Councilmember Reese, you had a question. Um, maybe this one's for the planning director. Um, I always love being the person asking in the room, asking the uncomfortable question, so here we go. Um, what is the public policy rationale for annexation here, given that the applicant won't be paying property taxes, and it's going to cost the city money to annex this property. Well, as the one who feels like they're normally answering these uncomfortable questions, I'll do my best. Um, we uh, have had a, a long history of looking at uses of this nature, religious and civic nature, that have some need, usually for public services or public utilities. Um, that have sought annexation for that for that reason. Um, I think that may be the case here. Um, it's certainly at you, you all's judgment whether you want to look at the um, community benefit that the that the not for profit or, or religious uh, group brings when uh, annexation is likely to be fiscally negative, which I, appears to be the case here. So um, I think we we have um, traditionally recognize the need for some of these um, mission-based or nonprofit organizations have access to city services to be successful in developing. Certainly, it's very much at you all's discretion about whether or not that counterbalances the, the cost of services and other considerations out here. That's a really Thank good you. answer. Thank you, Ms. Jan. Any, any further comments from staff at this time? Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm now uh, going to turn to uh, any public comment that we might have. I don't believe anyone has signed up to speak on this item. Is there any, okay. Uh, please come forward and tell us your name and address. My name is Angela Bailey. I'm actually the head of school, International Montessori School, and so representing them, our address is at 3001 Academy Road, Building 200 in Durham. Uh, so to answer your tax question, we are currently operating within the city limits at our current location. We have outgrown that location. We, we pretty much only have classroom space at this point, <laughs> and our enrollment continues to grow. Uh, we are a multilingual Montessori school that serves children from 18 months up through sixth grade with future plans to go at least until eighth grade, uh, hence the need for a new property. So currently, um, Triangle United Soccer Association is on that property at 5510 Barbie Chapel Road to answer one of your questions. Thank you. Um, and they have operated there for a period of 10 years. And so they will continue to operate. And we have partnered, so to speak, um, in joining together to make use of this facility because it is slightly bigger than we need. Uh, but we have synergies between the two organizations. We have common missions, and we serve the same general um, population. 
with youth education, youth sports. So for us, it felt like an ideal win for all of us to come together and make the most use of the property within Durham's county and city limits. Uh, so we're maximizing use where schools typically are not gonna use it on the nights and the weekends, uh, but this property will be well utilized. Thank you. Is it a soccer field? Is it one soccer field? It will be three soccer fields, um, two outdoor fields, and one indoor building, indoor field, along with offices that serve uh, that organization. How big will the fields be, do you know? That is on the site plan approval um, and was also in the minor special use permit that was approved, but I do not know the specific square footage okay. because... I deal with my square footage. Understood. <laughs> Are they large fields? Um, they, one is a competition size field, and then the other field is designed to be smaller to be able to run the youth, um, the, the younger students, younger children, so they can run multiple practices and games at the same time. Um, as far as the building is concerned, it was looked at as far as the value it would impact. It is not a two-story building. It is a large uh, prefabricated steel building, so that one is a large field as well. Great. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions, Ms. Bailey? Is that a, did I That's get that correct. right? Are there any questions for Ms. Bailey or any comments? I'll just comment that I thought Pat's answer was good, but hers was better. Okay. <laughs> that was awesome. It's my project, so. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bailey, thank you for being here. I'll ask you before you leave if you would also go to the Sorry. clerk's desk and fill out a card so we you. have a record of your being here. Okay. Thank you. Any questions or comments for the applicant or for staff? Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? This is a public hearing. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Would you, Mr. Grease? I would like to move to adopt an ordinance annexing 5510 Barbie Chapel Road into the city of Durham. Your foresight is remarkable. <laughs> uh, Madam Clerk, please, thank you. Your, <laughs> Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 4-0. Mayor, I'd like to make another motion. Mr. Reese. I'd like to move to adopt a consistency, st consistency statement as required by state law and set forth in the agenda. Uh, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Please close the vote. The motion passes 4-0. Thank Mayor. you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Reese. I'd, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to move to adopt an ordinance amending the Durham Unified Development Ordinance in the very complicated and specific way set forth in our agenda. Uh, duly noted. Is there a second? second? Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. That's a lot of words, Mr. Mayor. A lot of words. And the motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Uh, as a uh, former Triangle United soccer coach for a long, long time, I'm uh, glad that uh, they're going to have a good facility at that, uh, that location or continue to have a good facility there. Thank you. And as a former Montessori teacher, thank you for your work. There you go. You didn't know it was going to be so much fun, did you, Ms. Bailey? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll now move to item 27, consolidated annexation for Huntington Valley. Uh, and um, we will hear first the report from staff. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Requests for a utility extension, voluntary annexation, an initial zoning map change have been received from Robert Schunk for a 50.255 acre uh, area of land located south of Walsburg, Walsenburg Drive, including the area located along an unopened Rushmore Place and Ripplebrook Road. The current configuration of this area includes 102 single-family lots, one open space lot, and one city-owned greenway parcel. The applicant intends on recombining the lots into 90 single-family lots and an open space parcel. The city-owned greenway parcel has been included in the request to avoid creating a donut hole situation. The area is presently zoned Residential Suburban 10 and Eno River Watershed Protection Overlay District and staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning request or zoning district. Should the council act favorably, approval of the annexation petition and zoning would become effective on September 30th, 2019. City and county operational departments, such as Solid Waste, Fire, and Emergency Service have reviewed, their requ reviewed this request and have not identified any significant negative service delivery 
costs or impacts. The Public Works and Water Management Departments performed the utility impact analysis for the utility extension agreement and determined that the existing City of Durham water and sewer mains have the capacity to serve the project and the Budget and Management Service Department performed a fiscal impact analysis which determined that the proposed annexation will become revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is for the consistency statement and the third is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. We have heard a report from staff and I'm gonna now declare this public hearing open. And first I wanna ask, are there any questions for staff by members of the council. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Council member. Maybe I'm a little dense here. Um, there are, the current configuration is 102 single family lots and the annexation request imagines that the parcel will be reconfigured for into 90 single family parcels. Is that right? That's correct. How does that work? Are like a handful of parcels combined? Do they just do a whole new map? Like, what does that look? What is? How does that work? Uh, I think the applicant would be best to answer that. Thank you. Awesome. And I'll stop asking you. Thank you. Looks like uh, maybe Mr. Young has a comment as well. So, as Ms. Sunyak suggested, you please do ask the applicant. But um, if, if this property is under common ownership, they can file a plat to essentially redraw all of those existing lot lines. This area was platted. It's many years ago um, with the anticipation of future development. So it can, it can be replatted to, to a, a configuration of 90 lots. My um, understanding is our ordinance requires a second point of access at 90 lots. So it's likely that they're seeking to, to serve this with only one point of access. Thank you. Any more questions for staff? Wouldn't that mean they'd have to have 89 lots? Or is it more than 90? Hi, Pat. Uh, Pat, Hi, Pat. The, 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 the <laughs> council member Reese asked. Sure, so it's more, the ordinance is more than 90, Got so it. they can do 90. Okay, that's, thank you. Thank you. All right, any more questions for staff? Uh, if not, we have one person signed up to speak on this item, Mr. Schock, Mr. Robert Schock. Welcome, Mr. Schock. You have three minutes. It's a public hearing, and should we decide you need more, that will be available to you. I should not need more. Good. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mayors of City Council. Uh, my name is Robert Schunk. Uh, I live at uh, 2627 University Drive here in Durham. Um, thank you, Jamie, for stepping in for Emily. Uh, so the site, as Pat indicated, was annexed quite a long time ago. Uh, the southern half of this parcel is already, has already been, was already annexed into the city of Durham. There's already sewer lines already somewhat through the property already. Uh, on the southern half of the property, there's a significant floodway and the floodplain that would uh, certainly be impactful to disturb. So the developer is looking to just develop the northern half of the site. So that hopefully that explains the reasoning behind that. Uh, all these lots are anywhere from 10 to just around 20,000 square feet. They'll remain that size. We're not proposing any rezoning to reduce the lot size. So this will you know, remain contextual to the larger lots in Northern Durham. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm here for any other questions. Any other comments? Mr. Sean, have you considered a uh, proffer to make a contribution to the Durham Affordable Housing Fund? We have not, since I understand that is strictly a thing to do at the, uh, if you're zoning the site. Mm, it, it's not a thing to do strictly in any case. This is completely up to developers who uh, come before us to make a voluntary proffer or not. I did not come prepared uh, with that information. Uh, I never come prepared for that. I can say that uh, what is nice about this uh, this site is that, uh, or the, the developers and the builders' intentions, as a builder is looking to purchase this, um, once the, if this action passes, is to develop homes sub certainly be below the three hundred thousand uh, dollar market um, to be you know nice to be nice to have large lots on it. But I did not come prepared to uh, provide any proffer at this time. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, uh, Ms. Sunyak? Looks like you have a comment. 
Just a, a quick comment. So without a development plan, uh, staff does not have the ability to review or offer or accept yeah. any proffers. Thank you. I had forgotten that there was no development plan on that. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to comment on item 27? This is a public hearing item. Is there anyone that would like to make any comments on this? All right, thank you so much. Uh, without uh, any further comment, I'm gonna declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. We would need a motion to adopt an ordinance annexing Huntington Valley. So Second. moved. Second. Moved and second that we adopt the ordinance, the annexation ordinance. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes four zero. Uh, the second motion we do adopt the consistency statement. So moved. Second. second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. Motion passes 4-0. Thank you. And the third motion will be to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO. So moved. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt the ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. And the motion passes 4-0. Thank you so much. All righty. We'll now move to item 28, consolidated annexation for Hopewell Academy. And again, uh, filling in for Ms. Struthers. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak. You're very welcome. Good evening. I'm Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Requests for utility extension, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning map change have been received from Chad Abbott of, of C3 Design and Engineering on behalf of RTP International Education for a 47.707 acre parcel of land located at 4651 Comstock Road. This property is at the edge of the Durham-Wake County border. If annexed, one par parcel south of the site owned by the um, Raleigh-Durham Airport will remain in the county. The area is presently zoned industrial light, and the staff recommends an exact translation of this zoning district. If the zoning is approved as recommended, the proposed three-story school building, four-story dormitory building, and soccer field would be permitted. A uh, site plan for these improvements have been submitted and are under review. That is case number D190054. Should the council act favorably, approval of the annexation petition and zoning would become effective on September 30th, 2019. City and county operational departments such as solid waste, fire, and EMS have reviewed this request and have not indicated any significant negative service delivery costs or impact. The Public Works and Water Management Departments performed utility impact analysis for the utility extension agreement and determined that the existing water and sewer service mains have capacity to serve the project. And the Budget Management Service Department performed a fiscal impact analysis, which determined that the proposed annexation will become revenue positive immediately upon annexation. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances Three motions are required for this application. The first is to adopt an ordinance annexing the property and entering into a utility extension agreement. The second is for the consistency statement and the third is to adopt the zoning ordinance. Thank you, Ms. Sonyak. You've heard the report from staff. I'm now gonna declare this public hearing open and first I'm gonna ask if there are any questions by members of the council for staff. I have a question. This will be revenue positive? That is correct. Does that mean that Hopewell Academy is a for-profit school? That is my understanding. Um, okay. Uh, I'll have some questions for the applicant. Thank you. Um, any other questions for staff? All righty. Uh, is there anyone who is, I see no one who has signed up to speak on item 28. Is there anyone who would, here who would like to speak on item 28? Oh, yes, sir. All right, thank you. Could you give us your name and uh, address? My name is Chad Abbott, uh, 2537 Suite 102 uh, in Butner, uh, North Carolina, Creedmoor, North Carolina 27522. 
Um, I am representing uh, RTP International, and the plan would be to provide an international private school here at this location. Uh, that is the reason the staff report notes dormitories uh, for international students. Um, I don't know about the revenue generation, what calculations staff may have went through for that, um, and I can't answer profit, not-for-profit, et cetera, um, but it is a private uh, international school. Okay. Um, did you say you can or cannot answer the question about for-profit or not? I, I, I do not know the, the, that part of their business. I, I do know it's a private international school. That's Okay. Um, what is your role, Mr. Adams? I'm the, I'm the uh, civil engineer site planner gotcha. for the project. Okay. Is there anyone here from the school? The, they, they are not in attendance. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Abbott. Is there anything else that you want to add at this time? Uh, I would just add that the uh, cost of services for the city, the water line is already there. We would not be actually extending utilities. Uh, there's a uh, city uh, zone property across the street that's been previously developed. We would simply be tapping that line uh, for our services and the county runs sewer. Our project would be developing county sewer through our property. Uh, so that would not be a city service, but it's a county uh, service that we'd be extending already through our property to finish out one of their sewer uh, legs that they've already pushed through that basin. So, Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Are there any questions for the applicant or for staff? Mr. Mayor, um, thank you. I feel like I would have questions for the applicant, for the people who are actually running the school if they were here, and I'm concerned that they're not here to answer those questions. Yeah. Is there anyone from the school here? No one from the school? Okay. Yeah. No, I understood. Yeah. No, we, we don't expect you all to be able to answer these questions. I appreciate it. So, uh, you, uh, Council Member? I'm just, everybody's raising their hand. Do you want to speak? Someone would like to speak? Sure. So this is a public hearing, uh, and if you uh, would like to speak, uh, please come to the podium. And Mr. Abbott, I'm going to ask you and this speaker, if you could, uh, before the meeting is over, or after the meeting is over, after this item is over, if you could go to the clerk's desk and fill out one of those cards so we'll have a record of your presence. Thank you. Hi, could you give us your name and address? Yes. Uh so my name is Akira Medina, and I live at 12 Haytai Lane behind the Cultural Center. Um, so before you make a decision, of course, um, I just want this to be taken into consideration that once this like for-profit school will be built, the area will probably like the value will increase, and then a lot of students who live there won't even be able to attend the school. Um, so I, I just want to express that hopefully there may be like a situation where even though it's international and for profit, that they will still allow some members of the community who are there to come and attend the school without having to pay the tuition, just because this is it would only benefit the students as well in the community. Thank you for your comments. Just, just throwing that out there. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this item? Miss um, Sunyak. Uh, I would like to hear from the representatives of the school before we take this up, what would be the best way for us to handle that? Um, so the application could be carried or continued um, to a, a date certain. Um, the concern regarding that obviously is that this also involves an annexation. Um, so if the matter is not voted upon in this quarter, then the annexation would become effective um, essentially if approved in December as opposed to uh, September 30th. All right. So um, 
we could ask to hear from them uh, two weeks from now, could we not? Um, that would be in October, Ms. Mayor, mm -hmm. which is after this current quarter. Yeah. Leave. Yeah. So, if, so if you if you continued this to the October seventh date or any time after um, September thirtieth, then the annexation and zoning would not become effective until December thirty first. Understood. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. The builders asking to please. Be heard. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, City Council members. Uh, I've been working on this project sir, for about. Excuse me, sir. Could I'm you? I'm sorry, Steve Hubrick. I live at 31 Trailwood Drive, Durham, North Carolina. Uh, I'm with Hubrick Development, Hubrick Construction. I've been working with Hopewell. They're an existing uh, private school that's located in Cary. It's an international private school. The thinking is to bring 200 students from abroad, uh, mainly China, and then have 400 local students. The project is a 200 bed dormitory as well as a 70 approximately 75,000 square foot school building and there's some significant impact fees associated with this project we've got because of all the beds of the dormitory in addition to the school building I think we've got uh, roughly 350,000 to 400 thousand dollars worth of impact fees so this is a, a large uh, payment as far as taxes or impact fees to for this project and there's a 12 inch water main as well as a sanitary sewer that runs right up to the property so we are extending the durham county sewer system we also are tapping onto the existing 12 inch main that's there along with some additional uh significant impact fees to the project so i just want to bring that up I don't, I can't really speak to the not-for-profit or for-profit, but it's uh, some significant fees that are coming to the city, so. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate it, sir. And I'll fill out a card. Yeah. Mayor Pritchett. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I've just reviewed the school's website, and on the website it says that it is a not-for-profit school. Um, so I don't know why it's revenue positive. It may be just the impact fees. The impact fees, I bet. Um, but it looks like they are not for profit school and therefore would not be paying property taxes. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young with Planning Department. So our colleagues in the finance, uh, excuse me, budget management service department um, run and administer the financial impact analysis. They do do an assessment in this regard. So I can't, I just, without some, that staff being able to consult that staff, I can't Understood. speak further. I appreciate and understand your concern. And if the item's deferred, we'll have a full report on it. Understood. I'm just curious if one portion is nonprofit and one is not because of the international student component. So they could be getting nonprofit status for the students who are U.S. students, but not for the international students. Mm -hmm. Perhaps so. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, can we get some clarification on who the applicant is? Is the applicant Hopewell itself? Chad Abbott of C3 Design. Right, that's right. So, so in the memo, Chad Abbott, you're the applicant. Mr. Abbott, thank you. On behalf of Randy Taylor with RTE. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's the um, school's parent company. Okay, so on the Secretary of State's website, Hopewell Academy, Academy itself is a nonprofit. That's how it's registered. But RTP International Education LLC is registered as a LLC, a limited liability corporation. So that may be the distinction. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I'm inclined to go ahead with this, but I'm also, if there are significant objections by other members of the council, I could wait as well. Okay. Um, I, guess, well, I just, just wanted to speak briefly yeah. to the um, issue raised by the resident who lives nearby that spoke. I think based on what I can see, um, it looks like the expansion is geared primarily toward the boosting the international portion of the school, which from what I can see on their website is fairly lucrative for them. Um, and, uh, and But since those folks will be coming from other countries, it's not entirely clear to me how that would impact the um, the surrounding property values 
just to have the dormitory there and the, the school. Um, but that's just me trying to surmise, although we've got a late entrant to the room who may want to speak. Uh, uh, sir, would you like to speak to us? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, please give us your name and address, and we're glad to have you here. I um, apologize to the council. One flat tire, and I was watching you online, so I was really nervous. So, Randy Taylor, head of school, Hopewell Academy, um, and so I can answer those questions. Thank you. So, I think one of the questions is, is Hopewell Academy a nonprofit or a for-profit, and how do you, does that interact with your parent company, which apparently is an LLC? Uh, it is a nonprofit, and uh, right now this parent company has invested in us in order to allow us to acquire these facilities if passed tonight. I'm sorry, I missed that. They have allowed you to... They're investing in us mm -hmm. as a nonprofit in order to make these facilities available. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I understand that, but does that mean that the parent company is a for-profit company and they're the ones that'll be building the facilities and therefore, hence the, the for-profit status that we've noted in our... Yes, sir, uh, Your Honor. Uh, projections. Okay. All right. Okay. And so uh, you will be uh, expanding to serve international students? Uh, yes, sir. This will be very unique in the area because the dormitory will be a co-ed dorm divided by floors. And uh, it will be the first, I believe, in its kind for a high school. Actually, we're 6 through 12 in the region. And mainly for international students, or how will that uh, Actually, we hope to market uh, for around the United States, but as well as international students. Okay. Um, so it won't mo mainly be for people that live here. It'll mainly be for people who come from other places. Well, our uh, building size uh, will house uh, administrative building and classrooms around 680 students. So we actually hope to be around half and half. Uh, 200 students in this dormitory, uh, and then uh, around 200 to start, we hope, in our local area. Uh, but we do hope to grow further and eventually add on. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Just, just one question. Um, I'm sorry, just to go back to the, the question about the for-profit and the non-profit. So the for-profit company is building the building that you all will be renting? Yes. Okay. Um, so the so they're the applicant here. Well, I have to look to our builder on the technical aspect of that. The uh, the, yes. the civil engineer is the actual applicant. Okay, okay, I think I got it. Yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> Sorry for being out of breath. It's all, all right. good. Appreciate you making it. Thank you. And uh, I could please ask again all of our speakers who have not signed up if you all could do so before you leave today. All right. Um, Council members, uh, well, first of all, is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? This is a public hearing. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? All right. Uh, any more comments or questions by the council members before I close the public hearing? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. The matter is back before the council. Mayor, I'll move to adopt an ordinance annexing Hopewell Academy into the city of Durham as set forth in the uh, agenda. Thank you so much, Council Member. Is there a second? Second. Moved and second to adopt the ordinance, the annexation ordinance. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 4 0. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'll move to adopt a consistency statement as required by law. Second. Uh, it's been moved and second to adopt the consistency statement. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. The motion passes 4-0. Mr. Mayor, I'll move to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance as set forth in the agenda. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the uh, ordinance amending the UDO. Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Please close the vote. <coughs> and the motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Madam, uh, Ms. Sunyak, again, thank you for uh, Yeoman's job tonight. We appreciate you. Um, there being no further business to come before this body, I'm going to declare this meeting adjourned at 9.09. Thank you. <clears throat>
Thank you, Madam Manager. You were quite well. <laughs> you didn't have to do Difficult too much job.